Under the supervision of Joel Kutcher Gershenfeld, the students from Brandeis looked at the human side of the equation. They looked at the reality of climate change increasingly challenges on our lifestyle, our mobility habits, and exacerbating the existing inequalities. Large disparities exist between countries, regions, and communities regarding accessibility to transport with some individuals unable to escape the hazardous effects of climate change or access their essential needs. Representing Brandeis, I am pleased to welcome Amanda Yu. Thank you, Cecilia. In her 1988 song, Fast Car, American singer-songwriter Tracy Chapman opens with the following lyrics. You've got a fast car and I want a ticket to anywhere. Maybe we can make a deal. Maybe together we can get somewhere. Any place is better. Starting from zero, got nothing to lose. Maybe we'll make something. Me, myself, I've got nothing to prove. Chapman sings about a yearning for social mobility and hope for a better life, facilitated by that eponymous fast car. Her song has had a recent rediscovery and its message of struggle and hope continues to resonate. Despite enormous economic growth and immense technological change, the challenges we faced nearly 40 years ago have not changed. When I listen to Fast Car, I think about my own story of mobility, generations of immigrants fleeing oppression and making sacrifices so that their children could have better lives. I am grateful for the opportunities their sacrifices bestowed on me, but I worry that those opportunities are rapidly disappearing. In many ways, the world has never been more mobile. We can fly across the globe, have an electric car drive us to work, and even travel to outer space. This kinetic freedom is, however, restricted to the privileged mobile elite. The UNDP reports that 45% of the global population struggles to access essential health care due to transportation limitations, with over 1 billion people lacking access to all weather roads, exacerbating societal inequalities. Social mobility is limited globally. An OECD study suggests that it could take 150 years for a child from a poor family to reach their country's average income. The freedom of mobility is a facade available to the wealthy and denied to billions across the globe. As economic inequality rises, opportunities like my family's are becoming fewer and farther between. The hope for a better life that Chapman sang about is at risk. Our research team grappled with a paradox. Lifestyle is a function of the choices people make, but those choices aren't always equally available to all. There are structural and societal barriers that mean you can't just select a lifestyle. The climate crisis worsens this existing barriers, disproportionately affecting those least responsible for unsustainable consumption. Rising inequality and increasing xenophobia coincide with a glowing, growing global displacement crisis. Currently, an estimated 110 million people are displaced worldwide, a figure expected to escalate because of climate change. Despite these barriers, we also see opportunities for transformation and a chance to rethink mobility in ways that reverse disparities and pioneer a better future for us all. There is an opportunity to rebalance our society and ecosystem, but we need to find a way to inspire politicians, industry, and citizens to collaborate to ad advance mobility solutions that promote positive societal changes. So I ask you, think about the journey and the sacrifices that your forebearers made. How were they able to advance social mobility to enable to, you to be here today? Do you think they could have made that journey in our current world? And what do you think we need to do today to enable that kind of mobility for future generations? Thank you, Amanda, for that challenging presentation and, and your questions. Will you please kick us off with your question for Majora? Hi, Majora. Many people have least resource communities and countries to pursue better opportunities elsewhere. How do we continue to enable this kind of mobility freedom 
and how can mobility strategies provide opportunities within the communities they leave? Wow. Well, thank you, Amanda, number one, for evoking Tracy Chapman, always a good thing. And uh, that's how much that song actually meant to me when I was coming up in my own community and it was all about trying to leave to get out. Um, so thank you for the, the segue, but, but the first part of your question actually leads me to, reminds me of a Toni Morrison quote, another great American sage. Uh, Utopias are defined by the people who are not allowed in. Because when many people think of the freedom of mobility, images of a utopia with driverless electric cars and other symbols belonging to the wealthiest among us come to mind. However, improving local economic mobility within low status communities is my version of utopia. I describe what you refer to as less resourced or poor communities from which people are trying to leave as a low status. These are the places all around the world where schools, public health, air and water quality, food options and career and lifestyle opportunities are worse than in other parts of the same town. Inequality is assumed by those in and outside of those places. Many of us from low status communities measure our success by how far we get away from those communities where we were raised. Um, increasing the freedom to leave may be good for some individuals, but it's an extractive ideal that takes the local talent out. And when people like this continue to leave, they take their history, their culture, consumer spending, long-term financial acumen, and their positive influence on their own community away from the places that need them the most. That result is statistically, it's concentrated poverty and an even greater desire to leave. We know mobility technology will improve to become cleaner and more accessible, we know that. But if history is any guide, Low status communities will continue to be developed in ways that repel that talent instead of retaining it. Could mobility innovations be used to help solve issues of inequality? Could retaining more of the talent in low status communities be an important part of that solution? I think so. For example, as we convert to electric vehicle power, with I understand all the conversations we had about that, but but with so much less noise and pollution, honestly, in urban areas, it could become much nicer to live in areas where there were expressways, where there are expressways. However, since most expressways, at least in the States, are built in lower status communities, and that's where, you know, the poor, you know, the people of color, that's where they were stuck and had to be, um, suddenly, because there's less noise and pollution, it might be not be so bad to live near there, right? So the people who live there currently would benefit in the short term, but not for long, if they are renters or unaware of how to keep their property um, as it increases in value, thus increasing their family's generational wealth. Can we act so we can drastically reduce displacement and gentrification that usually comes <clears throat> with new development? Mobility's great benefit can be used to keep people happy and healthy wherever they are and actually be used to support and develop low status communities into much more economically mobile places that actually allow people to pursue their version of the American dream. Um, really all that it means is that we can actually use mobility as a way to help people move, understand they don't have to move out of their neighborhoods to live in better ones. Great, thank you for that, Majora. And Carlos, although you're the CEO of an automobile manufacturer, I believe you have some strong opinions on the human element and the global inequalities that exist. Will you chime in on this one? It, absolutely, and uh, it's true that uh, in this case, the case that was uh, so brilliantly described by Majora, we are not talking about mobility, we are talking about inequalities and misery and how we move out of misery and poverty uh, inequalities, which is a very different topic from, from mobility. One, one experience I can share, uh, having the privilege of having created many plants across the world and many plants uh, in places where there was a lot of poverty. Uh, when I look back, 
at what has happened in some around some of those plants, uh, it is quite clear that at least three to five thousand families were able to move out of poverty because of those plants, because of those manufacturing activities. So whatever we talk about cars, mobility, devices, whatever you want to pick, uh, it is clear that if we want to address the inequality and the poverty uh, drama that was described, you need to create value somewhere in that community so that people do not need to leave the community. So the real question is, how do you create value in the community for people to step out of poverty and make sure that they can have a good life uh, in the community with no pollution, no noise, and everything that was mentioned. I think that's the real question. In this case, mobility is not the solution. Mobility is just one of the components of the life of those people. And the manufacturing that could be connected to mobility may be a very good lever to create value. And I could present uh, many, many cases around the world in very, uh, very high poverty areas where uh, creating that activity uh, moved a significant number of families out of poverty, increased education, increased health care, increased quality of life. So uh, we cannot just uh, focus on mobility. Mobility is not the driver here. Mobility may be uh, one uh, way to create activity and high added value and good paid jobs and to move pop people out of poverty, but mobility is not the key solution for this for this problem. Thank you for that. Majora, do you want to uh, respond to that? <coughs> yes, it will have to be that a level of attention that recognizes that, yeah, we can create the kind of access to opportunity using mobility, um, both literally and figuratively, as a way to support these community communities that have traditionally only been almost used as the, uh, almost as the collateral damage of getting business done. And being very deliberate about it and recognizing that we can, can't undo the historic harms that happens as a result of much of the business practices that that are that are, are the underpinning of our global economy, but we can recognize that we don't have to continue doing it the same way. Because what we've often seen is that the places where, um, whether it's energy was extracted, you know, or or mined, or whatever, um, or products are built, that those areas have also, you know, been devastated in some way, shape, or form. We now have technology. That, and even then we had some technology and just didn't have to do things as disgustingly as we did. We can do things differently now. And I think, but again, we as best business leaders have to understand that we need to like put that out first and foremost. I think we can't pretend that it's just, oh, this is just the way that we have to do things because it's, it's never is. You know, maybe our bottom lines will have to be cut a little bit. I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but I think, you know, ultimately we've got to acknowledge that we that we'd like to move in a different direction and put the money behind it to make it happen. Thank you. So Majora mentioned technology. So Manal, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about how we might actually think about technology, whether it's automation or other forms of technology that might actually support increased access to opportunities, social mobility, physical mobility, however we think like to define mobility. What role do you think technology can play in that? Well, uh, AI's massive ability to analyze data uh, allows us to predict occupancy rates, for example, and in, in, in rural areas, predict demand in those areas, and accordingly allocate resources to those locations. So one thing I'd like to also mention to Carlos um, is that, of course, the availability of, of businesses in certain areas will, 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 will return with economic growth to those locations. However, without mobility solutions, businesses would not go and, and actually be built up in those areas. So mobility is required in order to, for businesses to flourish. They are a precursor for, um, for economic growth, for, for uh, especially uh, left out uh, areas. 
and um, and AI can actually predict, you know, the, the occupancy rate, as I said, uh, the demand on those areas, uh, and accordingly, uh, policymakers can allocate um, uh, infrastructure budgets in order to improve infrastructure in order to reach those those areas. We can also build a smart infrastructure that um, that uh, alleviates. Um, pressure over uh, the, uh, over the, the infrastructure of demand demanding mobility so AI can actually be used in many ways in order to to improve access of mobility to to these uh, regions thank you and so we've been talking about this topic from a perspective that I take as could be urban areas again in the in the global north primarily what about how this entire conversation applies? to the global south. Um, Roberto, do you want to share some, some perspectives? And I think about the, the global south and rural areas everywhere. How do you, we think about this issue in those geographies? Thank you, Cecilia. In fact, let's say we're somehow we are broadening the concept of mobility here. We're we'll talking about social mobility, but this real issue, let's say, the, 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 the mobility poverty is a real issue that somehow precludes people to, to move, let's say, in their social mobility trend. Uh, I don't know how many of you know of that, but many people in the global fault, they have jobs, but because of, let's say, lack of transportation or because transportation is too expensive, they sleep on the streets during the weekend, during the week, and only, only go back home on the weekends because they cannot afford uh, the mobility cost of going back home every day. So uh, for sure, let's say, uh, the, 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 the physical mobility is one of the prerequisites uh, for social mobility as well. So that's why, let's say, we have to address very seriously the issue of mobility poverty, because by addressing this issue, we are also addressing the issue of social mobility, because with more mobility, people can have access to better jobs, better quality of life, do not spend so much time on the transportation, do not get so tired, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a key issue uh, to improve mobility so that this can greatly facilitate social mobility as well. Thank you for that. So I've got another question uh, from our audience. Um, really want to talk about um, the affordability we're talking about social mobility. So there's a question from the audience that says, when we say that freedom of mobility, how do we make it affordable for marginalized people? Uh, let's see, how about Carlos, you start us on this one. Well, there, there are a lot of ways to make it affordable. Uh, the first uh, thing, the first thing I, I think we should mention is that uh, we don't have to uh, create mobility devices as uh, we usually create cars. There are two very um, concrete examples that I can mention that we call um, mobility devices. It's not about cars. It's about a specific niche of uh, regulations where you can make uh, mobility devices which are one third of the usual car footprint. Uh, of course, zero emission that you can use downtown and you can just uh, look for it. It's uh, the Fiat Topolino and the Citroën Ami. It's uh, a two seater and uh, you can uh, drive around. It's one third of the footprint. It's totally electric. And of course, it's very cheap because uh, you have to pay a monthly fee, which is the same as a mobile phone. So it's the same magnitude as the monthly fee of a mo mobile phone. So it's reasonably affordable. That's one way. Of course, uh, it moves around many of the regulations that have been piling up over the last decades on, on cars, on traditional cars. That's one way. The other way is to make sure that we use technologies that have been fully depreciated and clean, like the ethanol-based uh, mobility that uh, uh, Roberto was mentioning, which is one of the most affordable ones that currently exist and the cleanest one. And of course, we are, uh, as an industry, right now struggling uh, to make uh, electro mobility affordable, which is not, it's 40% more expensive than the conventional one. And it will take some time to uh, break a certain number of paradigms uh, to make sure that we bring the EVs to a level of affordability that at least the middle class 
uh, is uh, is uh, able to pay for. So that's uh, that's some of the directions in which we are moving. And uh, I'm not even talking about public transportation. I'm sure that my teammates will talk about it much better than I do. But there are a certain number of solutions that are already existing. But it's it's clear that the uh, EV technology is certainly going the wrong way uh, in terms of affordability, and we have been uh, explaining that for a while. It will take some time uh, to make that clean uh, mobility affordable. And uh, as we know, uh, in Asia, we can find much more cost competitive solutions right now on the basis of that same that same uh, technology, which means that the Western world that Matthias knows very well is going to be facing a very significant change, a Darwinian change in terms of uh, manufacturing footprint, starting with Germany, but also the Western world. And we'll see how uh, our societies are going to react to that. Thank you. So, Matthias, um, I'm sure you have, based on your earlier comments, I'm sure you have a perspective on this one. Why don't you jump in? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe I start with a more general point um, on the, uh, I think, very good uh, input that Amanda and uh, the, these, the students brought in um, of bringing extreme inequality into this conversation, which I think is very important. Uh, so the numbers are quite clear. The richest 1% of the world's population produced as much carbon pollution as in one year as the poorest two thirds of humanity. And a large part of this is due to transportation emissions, aviation, road transport in particular. So we thus need to link poverty and inequality with the effects of transportation emissions by the very rich. So I think we cannot really distinguish the two topics here as Carlos has tried to separate them, but they are very much interlinked, in particular due uh, on the one hand due to the effects the uh, imperial mode of the the of of living and the car industry has um, through the emissions, the very high emissions globally. We tend to talk about climate change as this very abstract topic, but there are studies showing that these outsized em emissions of the one percent, the top one percent of the global emitters, they will re be responsible for 1.3 million heat-related deaths until 2030, so in the next years. So this is very con concrete outcomes of how high emissions in the global north, partly also created by the car industry, is responsible for creating inequality, exacerbating inequality, creating desperate situations in the global south. Then there's another issue, which uh, is all around all the sacrifice zones that are currently created for the production of supposedly green energy and green uh, the, the mining of the resources necessary for these green solutions. This is also a key issue where at this moment there's inequality, new types of inequalities created um, in, in, in forms that some of the people on the ground label as uh, green forms of colonialism, new forms of green colonialism that are created by the efforts to transform car, the car industry in the global north without taking it into account the global effects of this. So I think we, we, we need to address this issue of inequality globally, um, which I think in the end come, boils down to uh, achieving global ju justice means degrowth for some, so less for some, um, to enable human flourishing for the many. And I think without bringing this perspective in, we are losing sight of the bigger challenges that are uh, facing this entire conundrum of how to uh, provide mobility, also social mobility, which is in effect much more important for many people than, uh, than the, the question of car ownership or getting from A to B. Thank you. Majora, we talked about um, green colonialism. Do you want to, to mm -hmm. uh, provide a perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, it's another example of how much we've will continue, you know, to socialize the the actual costs and the costs of inequality in particular as we pri privatize the profits and we can continue doing that and I think the history of environmental inequality kind of speaks to that and just the way that, that capitalism works speaks to that as well. How do you, but but first again, I think we have to acknowledge that the same thing will happen, even if we haven't, it's got a nice little green color on it, it's still going to, be, people who are going to be suffering the inequalities that are traditionally reserved for the poorer and the darker in the world 
are going to be exacerbated yet again, unless we literally go, we're going to make some changes here. Like, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, the, the car is king and still is, you know, and, and that I think it's the same, you know, in, 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 um, in the EU as well, but the, the kind of subsidies that the oil and gas industry continues to get, the kind of subsidies that are literally supported by policymakers, you know, to continue to build more roads as opposed to more transit. These type, that, just that level of detail, which is often unfortunately lost on many people, and even you know pundits and and even some some uh, people that are out there like do mean really well some of them do anyway um we don't really acknowledge that that's a that's a thing that we have to deal with um so i'm always in in the, of the mind of that if we don't acknowledge it and if we're not actually making those moves to say you know what we we can do better because we can then we're going to continue to to continue to sort of socialize those costs and we're going to keep paying them over and over and over again thank you for that so i'm going to give one of our students a chance to jump in sasha i think you wanted to respond to something that roberto said a little bit ago yes um Thank you. So yes, it was something that uh, Roberto mentioned and, and also Matthias, it was regarding uh, sufficiency and regarding also degrowth in the travels. Um, what what uh, we've been thinking and what we've been looking at in our, in our research is that the sufficiency that we're not looking at is that um, in terms of, for example, public transport, in terms of green transportation, well, our world is super interconnected. And we want to e easily be able to go from one city to one to another and to easily be able to do all that. And we don't really foresee a future where we have to take less um, means of transportation, green means of transportation. I'm not talking about flying every weekend to go all around the world, but in terms of sustainable ways of transportation, uh, we don't really see uh, that being a um, an area where we could reduce uh, or where we could have most sufficiency. Great, thank you for that, Roberto. Do you want you have a comment? No, no. Just I, I fully agree with what you're saying, uh, Sasha. The problem is again we have eight billion people in the world, and this standard of consumption will not be available to, to everybody. So you have to have this in mind. Let's say that there are a few people that can do everything they want even in a cleaner way, but most of the people will never do what the, the, the global north can do today. This is a problem and we have to think about how to solve that issue. Okay, thank you for that. So I wanna to go to another question from our audience. Um, we've talked a, a bit about um, car makers are doing what they can. Carlos, you mentioned um, if you are asked to do something different, you will. So there is a, a concern about the role that the business community plays in driving consumer preferences. And so the question is, is there a way that the business community can support driving consumer preference for things such as smaller EVs, local goods, less consumption, things of that nature, public transportation, or are they merely at the whim of the consumers? So Carlos, um, can you start us off on that question? Sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think we can. Uh, of course, everybody will consider that we are not doing enough, but let me just point out a few things. And uh, I'm not in a position here to be uh, the lawyer or um, supporting the industry. I'm just sharing with you my observations. First of all, um, you mentioned, Cecilia, that uh, uh, Stellantis uh, will become a carbon neutral uh, corporation by 2038 with a one digit compensation, uh, which means 90% CO2 emissions against 2021 by uh, 2038 plus one digit compensation. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no Western country right now that is going to be carbon neutral before 2050. So I think we, we need to recognize that. We need to recognize, number one, it's possible. Number two, we are doing it. Uh, by the way, uh, in 2023, we are already at minus 12% against 2021, all scopes included. 
And we are on our way to be carbon neutral by 2038, which is my commitment to my grandchildren. That's point number one. Point number two is that, indeed, uh, we are promoting uh, mobility devices like uh, the uh, Citroen Ami or the Fiat Topolino, which are affordable, zero emission, and they have one third of the usual footprint of a car. So we are bringing silence, we are bringing no emissions, and we are bringing less usage of the areas, mainly in the urban areas. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also consider that uh, we are uh, now proposing, and it is public, uh, more compact cars uh, which are zero emission. And when we were talking about green colonialism, which I think is a very, uh, very appropriate theme, uh, we are not addressing the gorilla in the room. And the gorilla in the room is what are the uh, global north countries doing to share their wealth with the global south? And as we know, this is the big hot point, difficult point of all the COP conferences, which are about sharing the wealth, uh, global north towards global south. And this is the gorilla in the room. So we can focus on cars. It's fine. Uh, no problem with the cars. We can change them. We can even do something else than cars. Uh, if the societies in which we operate are expecting that, we can promote zero emission vehicles, which we are doing, smaller vehicles, as it was requested. All of this is now on sale. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying underway, on sale. And I don't know any Western country that will be carbon neutral by 2038. If there is one, please mention it. Uh, that is exactly the reality of, of what uh, we are doing. At the end of the day, I think the big issue is the wealth uh, distribution around the planet between the global north and the global south. And we are talking a lot about Western Europe, etc. but Western Europe should be leading the way uh, in changing the lifestyle, which actually it's not. And it's not the car makers who are deciding that, it's the population, the citizens who decide that through the elections in the democratic world. And this is the change of direction that needs to come out of the polls, out of the elections, if, uh, if need be. That's my comment, Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you. So, Carlos, I think you said we shouldn't expect to see gigantic electric SUVs, or that shouldn't be our aspiration in the future, I take it. Um, so, Matthias, I'm going to ask you our last question. Um, we've talked around this topic a lot, and we did get a question from our audience um, that was specifically directed to you. We need to do better with fewer resources and move towards forms of collective mobility. That's a quote that you shared with us publicly on our website. So how can we find a mobility system that can satisfy the people's needs in the different con conditions in the world matching with the world emission reduction? I mean, the, the, the question is too big for me to answer in uh, the, I guess, uh, less than one minute remaining, but I think, one key is that, and this also links a bit to the last question, I think we need to distinguish between the, the, the real needs people have, the need to getting from A to B, and certain types of need satisfiers. So means of satisfying these need, needs, for example, a car, but this could also be other forms of mobility. And this distinction opens um, a way to look beyond mere technological solutions. Uh, to what I consider the uh, the much more transformative and more effective solutions in particular, given the magnitude of the climate emergency we are in and the short time frame we have for solutions. So this means radically shifting towards public transportation, um, making public transportation affordable. I don't see the mobility devices Carlos presented as the solution, but rather as another means of uh, finding niche markets. Um, I, I understand that companies need to do this, but I think from a societal perspective, we have to be quite clear that affordable transportation, public transportation is the much more effective solution. Um, just very shortly commenting on the German experiment that was uh, launched after the COVID crisis of having a nine euro ticket, giving everyone access to all the public transportation around the entire country and also all the regional trains. I think this is these are the forms of making it um, accessible for everyone and really creating the, the more transformative changes that are necessary at this moment. And this also means 
getting rid of all the high profit business cases, such as electronic SUVs, for example. I think in the situations, companies just should not sell these anymore, um, even though they are very profitable. So thank you for that, Matthias. And now as we wrap up this last um, piece, there are a few observations. One, we need to broaden our thinking about mobility, not just physical mobility, but the social mobility that physical mobility enables. There's been lots that has happened to create the social inequities in, that we see across the globe as a result of our mobility solutions that we have in place today. And as we think about solutions and move to greener solutions and more sustainable solutions, we need to do that with not only the environment in mind, but we need to think about the social impact of it as well. Also, one thing that strikes me is we need to remember that there is no one solution. We've heard folks say we want EVs, but that's not the solution. We want public transportation, but that's not the solution. Perhaps we need to think about a portfolio of solutions so that you have the best solution applied to the specific population need so that everyone has their needs met. So now let's move on to wrap the debate.